Thank you everybody for joining. Uh, my name is Robin Tiberio and I am the co-chair of the schools committee for the UVA Club of Washington, DC. Um, so we put on programming for UVA alumni, family and friends of alumni in the Washington, DC area. Obviously now that we've gone virtual, our reach is a little bit larger, which is nice. Um, and we, um, the schools committee typically does programming around incoming first years, um, but occasionally we do kind of special programs uh, and this is, this is one of them. So uh, we welcome you all here. We're very excited to have you. Um, if you're joining us for the first time, you can go to dcwho.org and check out the rest of our programming. Um, we're a big, big club, we're a big board and we put on a ton of really amazing events. Um, so check it out if you haven't had a chance to. Um, and with that, I will uh, do a brief introduction for Emily. Um, Emily Pick is going to be our speaker tonight, leading us through, so you want to be an entrepreneur. Uh, and I know Emily from UVA. Uh, we were both class of 2014. Uh, she was actually in the first undergrad Batten class. Uh, and she was also on the women's growing team. So she had, uh, you know, all four years as a student athlete. Um, and after she graduated, moved to New York, was there for a while, and then in the past year, uh, decided to break away from the traditional corporate scene and uh, co-found a new company called Patel. Um, so she is an entrepreneur and has gone through this experience very recently, and I think she has a lot of great uh, information to share and exercises to walk everybody through. So um, with that, I will turn it over to Emily. Amazing. Oh, cool. Oh, man, I'm really on the on the screen. Perfect. Can everyone hear me? Okay, I have my little noise canceling AirPods in. Okay, awesome. Um, lovely. Well, it's so good to be here. Robin and I um, are actually in the same sorority at UVA. So it's fun to reconnect for all of the reasons, including this and um, really appreciate you all calling in. I will have a PowerPoint, though I'm really hoping to make this interactive, so we'll be doing some exercises. If you're calling in from a phone, that's absolutely fine, um, but just preparing you that there will be, you know, a couple of minutes where I'll be asking you to do um, some rating potentially, because my goal on this call slash workshop is for you to have some sort of step forward with any small or large idea that you have. It is really helpful to be held accountable, I think, to just start to think of yourself as a potential entrepreneur, and maybe you already are one. So I'll also ask you to introduce yourself with a couple of specific questions in the chat. Um, and I will just get started otherwise. So um, thanks again for joining. And I'll, I'll do a little bit more of an overview on who I am in the case it's helpful um, as, we, as we get these slides going here. If you have any questions throughout this, I'll also say while my slow computer loads, Michael and Robin are manning the chat. Um, and so I think since there are already 10 or 20 of us here, probably um, just saying that you have a question or putting that question in the chat will help me know when to pause and they can kind of help call on you and we can have a discussion. If we don't get through all my slides, that's even better for you because hopefully it means you're getting more value um, from just interacting with the group. This is uh, my Propel deck. So we have some pretty vibrant branding. I'll share my site with you at some point. Um, so hopefully you, you enjoy it. As far as the agenda tonight, so we'll um, go through quickly what we're going to cover, do some introductions in the chat, and then I will talk a bit more about what building means to me and others, um, particularly in the Propel community, but others just in my life. And eventually, if we have time, I'll tell you a little bit more about um, the Propel story, but the getting started section is the more interactive, kind of start to get some, some juices flowing in regards to a potential entrepreneurial idea that you have. You won't need to share it out loud, by the way, this is purely just for fun and for you to be able to, um, to start to think through, like I said, some business ideas. So my hope is by the end of tonight, you will have a plan to understand if your idea, no matter how baked out it is, is worth pursuing, learn how to identify who your customers are and what they want. And a topic really important to me is um, I'll discuss uh, this and hopefully help you anticipate some of the mental pieces, the blocks that can come with building a company or a side hustle, given how different it is um, than necessarily being um, a team member of an existing company, no matter the size. So in the chat, I'll give you a minute to in a couple of sentences, try to cover these three points. Um, why you're here, 
So it could be as simple as um, for my brother, probably I asked him to come, but for you, maybe you are already an entrepreneur or you're working on being an entrepreneur. Um, so something that might help me be a little bit more pointed in what I go through throughout this workshop. If you have a business idea, no need to share what it is. Like I said, happy to kind of keep that to yourself for now, though. Hope you follow up with me if you want to chat about it. But what stage are you at? Um, so I listed a few examples on the slide. And then if you can think of one, um, and if not, you can just kind of chime in in the chat throughout the session. What's a, a single question that you would love help answering today? So be selfish. Let's make this like interesting for you. So please just take 30 seconds. Doesn't have to be uh, a beautiful paragraph to put that in the chat for me. Choosing which idea to pursue, getting connected with other entrepreneurs, Someone's in product development, which is exciting. Someone started consulting. That's awesome. Diana, are you consulting? You can put this in the chat part time or full time. Idea validation. Green, that's okay. Customer research. Diana's doing it full time. Amazing. Oh, green. <laughs> that's, that's great too. Um, perfect. So keep keep putting that in there. I'm going to keep the chat open. Can you all see the chat on my screen, by the way, if I keep it open? Can you see it? No? No. Just my slides. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Just want to make sure. Never know sometimes how Zoom does things. Um, oh, a parent of an entrepreneur. I wonder if that's, that could be my mother. Um, that's awesome. That's great that you want to, to learn a little bit more. High school student. Amazing. There's actually some uh, folks who, who skipped undergrad, not that I am recommending that, who, who came into Propel. So I think that's really interesting and um, happy to, to try to comment on, on entrepreneurship. Okay, perfect. So I'll, I'll move us along, but thank you so much for sharing. Keep it coming. I hope this inspires those who, who didn't write um, out their intentions quite yet. So my um, the organization that I built is called Propel and Propel is the community for future builders. So I use building as a term quite a bit. And I wanted to just cover with you all how I think about building. I think in the tech world or in the startup world at large, building, the connotation is either you are a founder building a product or service, or you are um, a product manager or engineer actually like coding and building um, an app or an interface online that folks will interact with. I think building is a lot more expansive than that. And in fact, being a bat and undergrad, we talked about building and leading from anywhere. And it just is ironic that this is also still how I think about it, probably uh, subconsciously is, is why. So um, you can really think of yourself as an entrepreneur from any seat that does not include the founder or CEO title. And I think that's really important because no matter who you are, whether you are the high school student thinking about college right now, you're the parent of someone who is an entrepreneur, or you want to maybe just make a passive or additional income stream, which was the place that I was coming from actually before I ultimately eventually quit, quit my full-time job um, to, to uh, build and operate my own company. You can do it from multiple seats. So we, we can call that operating, leading, or founding are sort of the three seats and underneath and um, those seats, you'll see a couple of ways that I would think about being entrepreneurial and just almost testing that ability to be entrepreneurial. If you are an entrepreneur, you probably started to crave entrepreneurship due to what you learned and gained from being in an operator seat, a leadership seat, um, and or maybe you were a founder previously. So I was in the operating and, and leading kind of boat for, for quite some time. Um, I learned how to kind of have this ownership mentality through executing on high priority goals, contributing to my businesses, product and vision. Um, I was leading a team. I was leading multiple teams at a given point. And I, as an athlete, was constantly also thinking about just how to lead by example um, and be seen as someone that was um, not only uh, you know, uh, a leader as far as my my strengths go and or my competitiveness went at least um, on the UVA rowing team, but also as far as how to treat people and how to think through team dynamics. And then what I really started to lean into was how could I find creativity in creating a business idea? And so I started with a side hustle and I'll, I'll go into this, but my side hustle was 
um, a career coaching company. That wasn't even a company. It was my friends and friends' siblings then knowing me eventually for my service, which was supporting them in job searches or career pivots or navigating challenging times in the workplace, um, which eventually led me to build a company that was a side hustle as well, and then took me to a place where I actually fundraised venture capital money with my two co-founders and took the leap to do this full time. And so there is no right or wrong path. And I talk about this loads with the folks in Propel that I work with who are um, operators, leaders, and founders, but they are all building. And in fact, they're also just building their own skill sets. So building is, I think, such a, a term that can be used in so many different areas. And I would encourage you to think about how you are already a builder and therefore an entrepreneur, essentially, um, in different facets of your life. So to just talk a little bit more about who I am, hopefully this slide is fun. I know it's a lot of words, so I will voice it over. Um, as I graduated from UVA, so I took literally the first job that was offered to me. Um, this was spring of 2014, so different environment. I know then 2021, um, graduated from the Batten School, became an analyst at what was a financial research firm called Third Bridge in New York and ended up staying there for much longer than the one, uh, the one year that I thought I would go there, having zero interest in financial institutions or research. But they had a really awesome um, promote from within culture and a lot of learning and development opportunities. And so I ended up being promoted multiple times to eventually be leading a um, department of 70 people and five teams. And um, that included like a, a, mayor, a cross country, um, p l for our clients in the Americas and um, just learned a lot, essentially decided to leverage that experience instead of go to business school, which was something that I was considering at the time. So if anyone has gone through that or is evaluating business school, or maybe you have went, you have gone, also happy to talk through that. I wanted to do something um, at a scrappy company all over again. So I'd been employee 20 at Third Bridge, helped grow it to about 400 people in the New York office missed creating best practices and coaching people in new roles and environments. So I decided to make a pivot to health tech, which was something I was really passionate about at the time. There's a lot of funding, there still is, um, from a VC perspective in health tech. I was also employee 20, um, maybe not so coincidentally, um, at a company called Capsule, which was pre-Series A. For, for those that don't know, that typically means that um, they're small, their product is not proven out yet, but they were confident enough and made me confident enough in joining. And I, I found a role in a backdoor way where they hadn't even published the position online, but I was introduced to the fiance of a friend. His name is Tom and he is now my very close friend and co-founder of Propel. So you never know who you're going to meet as you navigate different parts of your career. You see here, I grew into various roles there. I kind of de-leveled myself to just a lead title and um, with, pretty equitable pay to what I'd been making, grew a team from scratch, was promoted, worked for a really amazing boss there, pivoted to talent and people given my passion for coaching and development of others, um, and started to see a few problems um, in how folks were being developed and how career paths really worked in this awesome tech startup, and started to talk to a lot more people both in tech and otherwise. So my friends working at ad agencies, my, my siblings even, who were just trying to better understand what career pathways could look like for them. And I knew myself, I did not want to stay on an account management function forever. So I was really just trying to better inform myself. I started to build my company, um, or I guess both of my companies, my coaching company and Propel, while I was full-time employed. Um, did it kind of for fun, trying to understand if this idea would be sticky. It became sticky. And that all happened during COVID and happy to go, like I said, into that story if we have time down the line. But I have built various teams, products, services in various parts of my career. And again, encourage you to kind of think about your um, trajectory that way, um, however unplanned it was, because mine, cer mine certainly wasn't planned. What I learned along the way, again, this is more of like reflection, but it helps inform kind of why I ended up solving for the problem I did and, and built Propel. My favorite part about being on a team at work, just like my rowing team that I was on for eight years, was learning and knowing how to affect team dynamics and camaraderie. It was the best part of my day was, was being around my team and helping folks one-on-one -on -one as well. 
I also learned that I personally will achieve my goals in any environment um, if the team around me is happy. So there's um, an assessment I took that told me that I am an amiable driver, which means that I will achieve results if I feel good and the people around me feel good, literally. I'm not scared to ask for help. I love early communication. That was really important to me as a company grew. If that went away, I, I started to kind of learn what I did and didn't like about my environment. I love prioritizing relationships with my manager and direct reports. And I also thrived um, when we were in a more unstructured, scrappy startup environment and wanted to help people navigate that um, outside of just the people in my company. And so all of that did eventually lead me to building something, um, which we will get to, but I want to reposition kind of the point of, of this workshop, which is to talk about how to become an entrepreneur. And by mimicking my path, by no means will you or do you need to become an entrepreneur. So I don't recommend that um, in any way, shape or form, but I want to help you all maybe pressure test ideas or think through um, what it's like to, um, to put on the, the brain and mindset of an entrepreneur. I will also say, um, I never wanted to be a founder. This was not like a 10 year goal for me that by the time I was 30 or 40, I wanted to become a founder. And I didn't actually have a lot of friends in my life that were founding companies. And if I did, they were men. And um, so I found it really challenging at first to envision myself as a founder. So I don't know if that resonates with any of you, but if we have time to get to kind of the mental pieces of this, I also wanted to, to bring that up as, as well. Um, it is still really challenging for me. So also happy to, to talk through that offline, maybe if we, if we don't have time here. So open up a Google Doc, Word Doc. If you have a notepad, wonderful. Um, a sticky note on your computer if you wanna get out of the full screen here so you can multitask, I, I definitely recommend that. I started building as soon as I literally voiced my idea into the world. I know that is like very spiritual for those that believe in manifestation, but what I mean by that is not spiritually, it happened to me. What I mean is I did it, but I didn't do it until I, until I actually started talking about it. And I was very nervous to talk about it at first, because again, I didn't envision myself as a founder and I didn't have all of the language and um, terms in my like toolbox to discuss what I wanted to solve and, and how I wanted to do it. I also didn't see myself as a CEO. So there were a lot of things that kind of blocked me initially. So the first exercise that we're going to do is have you voice um, your idea into the world. And if you don't have a business idea or you aren't working on one, that's okay. I just ask you to think about a problem that you recently experienced. It could be a problem you face today. Even better, it could be a problem you're pretty familiar with. So something you have experienced quite a bit, whether it's due to who you are, where you live, um, the type of work you do, the type of activities that you do, um, perhaps something more social or economical. It could really be anything. What, start writing this down. What is a recent experience or problem that you want to practice seeing how, to, how you could create a plan to, to help solve? How did it affect you? Was it just you it affected or were you with others or do you know of others that it affected? And you could also pick a problem that affected your business. So um, there are a lot of products out there that solve business to business problems instead of just consumer um, behavior. So take a minute to jot down a problem statement and a few things about that problem. How did it make you feel? What were you doing when it happened? The next piece of this, which is arguably the, arguably the most important, is um, who else is impacted by this problem? So there are two types of entrepreneurs out there. If I were to try to be binary, it's of course a lot more complex than this, but typically you have entrepreneurs that are solving for a problem they have directly faced in their life or you have founders who want to build, who really want to be entrepreneurial and are going to do a lot of research to find out what problems exist for others or other businesses and solve that way. There's no right or wrong. I solve for something I experienced personally. There are a lot of folks in Propel solving for something that they know is a really um, excellent market and that's really awesome and, and is a great way to learn about new industries, new stakeholders, et cetera. But the first thing you should do before you even start to put together a business plan for a problem is what I would call pressure test it. 
And the best way to pressure test an, an idea is to get out of your own head and experience and talk to other people. And so the next part of this exercise is to answer some of these questions. How does someone else experience this problem? What do you know about those people? Where are they when they face the problem? So I have kind of two sets of questions here. Feel free to pick and choose. Where do they live? Where do they hang out? Doesn't, doesn't mean they're living and hanging out where they face the problem, but just like, who are they? Where do they do activities? What, do you personally know them? Or how would you find them? Would you look at Facebook groups? Would you look at other organizations where they are? Would you just do a call to action on your social media to find them? And how do they feel when they face this problem? So problems typically make you feel frustrated. Um, do they feel sad when they face this problem? Do they feel stressed out when they face this problem? Um, what are some of the characteristics you believe um, that you know about them and, and what you would want to verify? So we would call that idea validation and take 30 more seconds to just literally bullet. What are some things you know about these people? If you know anything about their demographics, so age, ethnicity, um, abilities, things like that, feel free to write that down as well. And this is just for you, just to kind of make some assumptions early, early on. You could also think about resources to educate yourself. So are there any podcasts you could listen to or influencers or speakers in the space? Um, are there celebrities that have voiced uh, challenges with this problem? Things like that. Awesome. So there are a few techniques that you can use to, to learn more about your customers. I've listed them here. There are things called user personas. There are th there's um, a framework called the five whys, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I've done user journey mapping myself. Um, in order to create a sp pretty specific next step for yourself from this call, um, and that's my aim is to, to help hold you accountable to just testing this. Or if you already have built a company, there is no wrong time to revisit who your customers are, especially if you're looking to find greater access to them, which typically a company is trying to grow or at least stay, you know, uh, stay, stay stable and consistent. So I would actually recommend doing this probably at a, a biannual, on a biannual basis to better learn if your customers have evolved or if the places that you find them have changed. You could do this in an incredibly lightweight way, or if you have the capital, you could of course outsource this or at least pay for platforms that can help you do user research. But I'm a big fan of being scrappy. And so I started off with a Google form survey and doing one-to-one -one phone calls. These days you would probably wanna do those over Zoom so you could easily transcribe them as well. And I also just literally last night um, used, did a focus group over Zoom with existing customers of mine. Um, to run through some pretty objective questions with them to get a better understanding of their understanding actually of what my business you know, does for them. And so you can create a discussion guide. I'd be happy to share a template after this if that's interesting. But no matter how you interview and talk with your customers, and I would do this in a consistent way, so create a discussion or interview guide so you're asking them the same questions and you can aggregate that data all in one place. Um, you want to do this uh, in a, a relatively standard and consistent way, like I just said, but also in a way in which you are knowing what the answer is you're hoping to get, but not biasing them towards that answer. So, sorry, if you believe your solution is so strong that you have to this problem, that you're going to point people in that direction, you won't there's no point to your customer interviews other than just contact with prospective clients and customers of yours. But if you actually want to make sure that your idea is not just viable to make you $10,000, which sounds great, but probably not something that you could live off of um, as a full-time gig, you want to really better evaluate what is the solution that feels right to them. And so I actually wouldn't spend too much time on drafting business plans, MVPs, et cetera, until you have probably much more than 10 user interviews, but at the least 10 to 20 user interviews. So this little screenshot down here was the Google survey that I started. It literally, um, sorry, I'm saying literally a lot, it's not a term I normally use. It says 20 and 30 something survey, and it was what I used 
with friends, friends of friends, and former direct reports when I was trying to identify how to sell my career coaching services. But what it ended up informing was the business I ended up building full-time, which is Propel. And so you also see here, I got about 22 responses and I have that um, Excel sheet still with their answers. Um, yes, Nancy, I'm happy to make this available to you for sure, to all of you rather. Nothing on here is, is uh, proprietary or anything. So write down now, what are two next steps you'll take? or at least one, but hopefully two. Two next steps you'll take now that you have thought about a problem and you've thought about some details on your potential customer base or bases. I didn't say that, but there certainly could be many types of customers for you. That's how it works for me. My customers live, at, live in a lot of different places and my demographic has actually changed quite a bit since I first started. And I would hope that one of your next steps is to create some sort of lightweight interview guide, discussion guide, or Google form to do what I did, which was blast probably like 40 emails of people in my life and text them follow up saying, could you fill out that survey I sent you? Looking to have it done in the next three weeks so that I can like make progress forward and we'll ask you follow up questions. Don't be shy. I think people really actually love being involved early on in someone's business idea. So also try to give them a heads up on this will be a five minute survey or a 10 minute and type form is another um, survey account you can use and they do a good job of allowing you to typically do a it like approximates how long um, they think it'll take, or you can take it yourself and approximate how long it took you. So I'm gonna skip over this question just for the sake of time, but now that you know a little bit more about how you would interview your customers, I would start to think about just your general market at large. And because this could have been a problem that you literally just came up with on the spot, you might not know much about your market. And so that's okay. Um, and I will send you these questions, but, um, Typical uh, best practice when thinking about a problem is before you jump to that solution that's in your mind or a way to, to solve for it, you would also get to know what the market landscape is. So just because you are unaware of a solution that exists doesn't mean a solution um, doesn't exist. So what I mean by that is I had a pretty specific way of thinking about being a career coach. I was very aware there were many other career coaches out there. And so I tried to do diligence. It's an interesting market for me because there are actually so many career coaches that exist and they target people at various stages of their career and for different reasons. And their branding is what differentiates them and their, their referral ability. So I ended up having to kind of stop myself from aggregating too many comparisons because what it just did was start to clutter the vision that I had for my business. If you are trying to though build a business to business type organization where you are creating pretty large contract deals, for example, with other businesses, or if you want to find a niche market that's not super saturated with competitors, doing this is so helpful. And naturally in your customer interviews, um, competitors names will come up, whether that's an individual, a business, something local, something national, something international, and it will help you. Um, Google is honestly where I would direct you. I, I don't, I think there's no one resource that will help because all of your ideas are probably quite diverse and impact different types of populations. But um, I think by nature of that first slide, articulating it into the world, friends, family members, and peers will start to tell you more about how they maybe have solved for that or, or companies they've heard of. And it doesn't stop. People send me competitors to my business all the time. And that's okay, because I would love to honestly like be peers with those people and better understand what they're doing. Um, I think, unfortunately, especially in tech, people get really competitive. And I don't think that makes a lot of sense because in my mind, there's typically enough room for everyone, unless you are looking to be, quote, a unicorn startup. And, and, and that's also amazing, but there's a reason why I'm not talking about venture scale and unicorn startups in this session. I don't think that's the ideal type of entrepreneur necessarily. And I think um, it's important to normalize that as well. So again, we'll send this to you later. Um, and then the last piece I'll talk about, I think before I go into my slides on um, my story and how I started building, there is a market for a lot of different ideas out there. But founder market fit is something really interesting. And typically if you're solving from a problem you experience, you are incredibly close to that problem. It may be advantageous for you to be the one solving the problem. And sometimes it might not be advantageous. And I cannot advise you one way or the other. 
But um, while it can be a competitive advantage due to your network, the people in your life who are um, navigating this problem, it's important to know that um, based on who you are in any founding team that you have, so co-founders or, or early on employees, um, you might ultimately end up deciding that given either how close you are to the problem or actually how far away you are and how and which skills that you have, that it's a problem and solution that you would prefer to leave on the table for someone else to solve for and find something that in five years from now, you'll be really glad that you are the one solving for it. When you don't have that advantage of dealing with it personally or navigating it personally, and you and your co-founders may not have strength to better tackle it. For example, if you are trying to build an app, a web or, or mobile app, and you cannot find a technical engineer co-founder or partner early on, it probably doesn't make sense for you to continue to solve for that problem in the way that you were planning to. That's a pretty obvious um, example. Technical engineering co-founders are quite important in a situation like that. But even still, if you can't find complementary team members that would really help you at the time in which you want to solve the problem, it may harm you down the line to eventually have to pivot completely or God forbid, like sunset the entire idea. But that happens as well. And that's why people say, you know, start off either small or with a side hustle. Sometimes it feels more palatable so that you're not putting all your eggs in one basket. Though I guess I now fall into the crazy entrepreneur category because I did put all my eggs in this basket, but found ways to finance it um, in a way that felt stable enough for, for me to, to want to continue to move forward. So if you haven't already, if you want to take 20 seconds to think about what makes you set up well, or your founding team or potential founding team set up well to tackle the problem that you um, are wanting to address, feel free to, to add that to your notes and then I'll, I'll move on. Awesome. Um, before we continue forward, any, of course, any questions about that exercise? Because I do want to make sure I, I pause before I keep monologuing. Okay. On the whole, if you can use emojis or put in the chat, would it be helpful for me to tell you a little bit more about like how I became an entrepreneur and the story there? Cool. I just want to make sure. Awesome. Okay. So I will do that for the next 10 minutes or so, and then we should have 10 minutes, hopefully for Q and A. If there's no, if there's not a lot of questions, so please think about them. I'm happy to be as real and candid as you'd like. Um, we can also maybe do a little bit of mingling with the other entrepreneurial folks on the call and do breakouts. So just start to think of some questions you have for me. You already put some great ones actually at the beginning. Ooh, Ben, okay, I'll try to hit on some obstacles. So, this is the problem that I spotted. So I'm gonna to try to go in the order of the exercise that I just did. Um, what I learned, so remember I worked at a company, neither of my companies were um, Fortune 500, so they weren't thousands of employees. My first company ended up being 400 employees at the end of my time there in just New York, so over a thousand globally. They had Asia and London offices. My second one, I was employee 20. Um, we grew a ton. It was a digital pharmacy, so a pharmacy that delivers and you can manage all your medications in your app. So in COVID, it actually grew quite a bit and we had a Series C fundraise right before that that um, allowed us to grow nationally during that time. So it was 900 people when I left. So it's still quite, um, quite a large organization. But what I saw um, across that, and, and like I said, a lot of my friends and family was that individuals in the workplace, particularly working at scrappier startups or let's call it less than 100 person startups or ones that don't have very built out HR teams or learning and development teams, are expected, rightfully so, to be self-starters and therefore left um, to their own devices to learn, upskill, figure out how to manage their teams and eventually lead. I'm a great example. I was given a pretty inflated title at 25 years old. I was promoted to a vice president of operations that um, gave me a lot of PL responsibility, fortunately with a lot of support from leadership at large, but I wanted to be able to um, learn from other people, which is why I decided to leave that organization and, and go to Capsule. And what I saw there was that a lot of folks that I worked with closely um, were supposed to make a lot of judgment calls in their business decisions. And what um, frustrated me or honestly um, concerned me the most was that they were uh, willing to make a lot of mistakes related to management. And that I don't think is a place where we 
um, in the workplace should be making a ton of mistakes. I think, of course, lived experiences help you, but um, to have structure and support around managing is really important. And unfortunately, um, you've probably heard this stat, people leave the workplace. The number one reason why they leave their workplace and go somewhere else is not just because there is a shiny object, like a you know lovely, exciting idea that someone is building or has built, but because they don't um, get along with or they face poor management in the day-to-day. And I am very passionate about that as a manager and someone who has gotten a lot of positive feedback on my management. And here are some company logos on the side of um, companies in New York at the time that were startups that I started to talk to people at who are experiencing the same thing. And so what happens is companies with great products and missions um, are left um, to pretty much break down as their people leave or their managers are not equipped for success. And I think that's completely unfortunate given how much funding goes into these companies. It also leaves a lot of individuals feeling like they are at least starting from square one again at the new company they decide to join or just generally less equipped to be amazing employers and leaders at the company they ultimately decide to build. Um, and they need to learn norms from websites or um, kind of tech influencers, and they aren't necessarily the right people to learn from always as well. So unfortunately, not a lot of people win in this situation. And um, at the same time, all of these companies are raising lots of money, even still throughout the pandemic, and expected to both balance creating a winning brand and product that um, everyone wants and loves, but also be great employers and be happy without the tools and resources to do so. There are a lot of competitors in this space, right? So if I talk about the market, which isn't on a slide here, um, there are loads of companies solving for education programs, loads of companies solving for um, resources and tooling online, whether that's LinkedIn Learning or um, newsletters or blog posts that you can follow people. And I'm sure you all learn professionally, at least from various people in your lives. What I always came back to is that relationships matter most. And you will spend time talking to a mentor more than you will take a course or read on tech Twitter or um, Google answers to your questions if you can find them. And so that's why coaching came into my life, but that's why Propel actually became the better solution to this problem. And this problem expanded from just being the problem lived by my friends and people in my life at tech startups. I added other logos here. So this is Twilio's logo. They're a massive company now, public um, this is a law firm that we have folks in Propel from. You're seeing McKinsey, Citibank, WeWork, lots of big companies. You still have people who don't feel advocated or supported for um, enough. And so I decided to figure out a way to solve for this. What I started with was a career coaching website. Here's my little screenshot. That's the same um, headshot that was on the blown up on the event break. And um, we couldn't figure out how to fix that. And I began to test a bunch of different concepts um, behind the scenes. So I started to talk to people a little bit more, sat down for coffee with my friend Tom. Um, but mostly I was just doing career coaching, balancing that with my full-time job, even through the pandemic. My website actually launched in March of 2020. So through the pandemic. The Propel Inception story um, looks a little bit differently. So I was really jazzed to solve this problem with my career coaching website, but uh, career coaching company rather. But what um, I didn't really see myself as was a full-time founder and entrepreneur, like I said earlier. It was very scary for me to articulate that. And so I started by telling very close friends and family. Um, I remember being, my brother was at Spotify. I remember being in that office with him in New York. I think the day before, unfortunately, a case um, was reported in that office and it had to close down about this idea that we were moving forward with, which was Tom, myself, and a third co-founder. Um, so Tom, remember, became a close friend. He helped me get my job at Capsule, was the fiance of a friend of mine. Scott, my third co-founder, had experience in building free communities. So he had just a slap, slap group for folks who were chief of staff in tech. And so he had this kind of expertise in community building I brought kind of the coaching leadership management expertise, and Tom had a really vast network of operators and folks looking to eventually be entrepreneurial and had been a chief of staff to a CEO as well. And so kind of had these operations chops that complemented my skill set, but none of us are technical 
And we were not trying to build a technical product. We were actually trying to just build a people oriented um, uh, solution. And so we were able to use other products that exist and still do today that we will eventually probably hire a couple engineers to help us with an eventual platform that could do this a little bit better than what we are um, able to do. So this is the Propel homepage. Um, it talks about building. So it's not coincidental that I'm leading a session on entrepreneurship when also my company helps people get to various parts of that building slide that I talked about, being excellent operators, being excellent leaders, or knowing how to eventually be really excellent CEOs and co-founders to help solve for solve from the bottom of what I believe um, is the problem that exists, which is that I don't think a lot of co-founders and CEOs are well equipped to manage folks. Um, and I don't necessarily think business school is always the answer to do that as well. Personal take, I'm not sure if people would agree. Um, so now we are not just building Propel, we're actually building something a lot bigger than Propel, which is under is in stealth, I can't really talk about it, but it's what we have been able to fundraise um, for today. And um, I get to do what I ultimately really wanted to do. So going back to like being a happy person as an entrepreneur, certainly quite stressful. I'm a one woman show in a lot of what I do, given how we divvied out our responsibilities for my company, but I get to coach people and help them um, coach each other. So a lot of peer coaching happens in a way that is outside of the confines of what their organizations um, will expense for them or provide for them, given just the nature of kind of how transitionary we all can be in our lives. And some companies are willing to support you in that journey. And some would rather you really tactfully take, you know, skill set based courses or, or find conferences that are quite applicable to the job. And um, I don't believe that that's necessarily fair. So the way that we monetize Propel um, is it's a membership fee. So um, while there are free communities that exist and while there are expensive programs for education that exist, we fall somewhere in the middle where people pay 50 bucks a month to be part of Propel. Felt really impostery at first to charge people from the get-go for something that I didn't know was going to work. So also happy to answer questions on that. Um, but that has led to some really lovely um, testimonials, which I will get to in the next slide. We built, we built Propel around three pillars. So as I thought through the mission and vision, we think about community, learning, and accountability. So I've used that language a lot here. It's something I'm really passionate about. Um, and this is, I think, my final slide before I'll truly open it up to, to questions. Um, oh my gosh, Nancy, that's, that's wonderful. Um, here are folks who you could look them up on LinkedIn. Hank actually is a UVA grad. Um, I don't think anyone else is. But they are all um, in there. Most of them, I would say, are in the first two decades of their career, so entering into mid, mid stage of their career, who have seen shifts or impacts that they didn't necessarily plan for by joining my business, but by being a paying member of Propel, they got access to inspiration, peers ultimately, so not me as a career coach, but I do try to coach them to find each other and I'm always available to talk through things with them. Um, and they've made really meaningful changes and just felt a support system um, that they didn't feel like they could find elsewhere. And so that's what I um, built and how I, I solved for it. And I will leave um, I will leave this slide up, but really happy to just jump into questions in our in our last ten minutes. Um, biggest obstacle, Ben. So the mental blocks. Um, I actually think that is my next slide. <laughs> I have a laundry list of them. Um, I will say this thing in bold. Most lived experiences do not prepare you to build your own company. I think by being an employee somewhere else where you are not fully responsible ultimately for the bottom line, um, being able to not have to worry about the hard things like formation of your big business or the legal um, components of it, sorting out the challenging conversations with your co-founders, how you're going to split ownership, what the ultimate exit um, looks like. So uh, for those not familiar with that language, that could be your plan is ultimately to sell it to another company, to IPO, to run it for the rest of your lives. Um, that looks different normally for different co-founders. So those hard conversations, wasn't prepared for those. Um, also just asking for help um, and checking yourself are the first two bullets here. So by checking yourself, I mean, listening to the voice in your head since especially in COVID and now in this remote first world that might continue, might not depending where you live. 
lots of alone time um, and that can be quite challenging. So I used to, last week I had white paper up on this white wall I have here. Um, maybe I'll, I should paint it with chalk uh, paint. And I physically started to whiteboard and brainstorm because I missed that ability from the workplace. I don't think the online uh, digital whiteboards, honestly, are as impactful as like sticky notes, Sharpies, and whiteboard paper. And so just like figuring out how to inspire yourself, um, I think is something that you will constantly deal with even when you get to build your team out quite a bit. And like I said, asking for help, not just from your co-founders or mentors, but for me, I ask my customers for a lot of help. So my customers are individuals building companies or creating um, uh, upskilling and, and becoming really awesome leaders. And so there's a lot of synergy between, I'm fortunate, there's a lot of synergy between what they're experiencing and I'm experiencing. But all of the best practices that my friends and peers in entrepreneurship tell me is spending more time with your customers will make you a lot more confident about the things that you're building and solving for. So those are some of the ones I would definitely extract from my, I don't know, there's probably 10 bullets there. The other obstacle I would say that I face is, um, is, is balancing growth of my business with just like making my customers who already use it happy. That's like a constant straight trade-off you'll always have to handle. Um, do most of your students work in digital products and services or physical? Um, yeah, so our um, community members are, it spans the gamut, truly. So um, the drop down when you apply for like what sector you work with, at, you work in, so like you're an employee in or you want to build a product and service in, spans every single sector. So we have folks um, building consumer products, so things you would eat, drink, touch, use in the day to day, software companies for sure. Um, like some of the more techie stuff like artificial um, intelligence or digital tooling. Um, and so if you go to my website, which is www.propel.run, R-U-N, seeing as there are a lot of propels that exist out there, we have some testimonials you, and you can like um, look at their LinkedIn or Google some of the brands and company names to just see how diverse it is. And like I said, we have people at law firms, um, McKinsey, like people who have resources available to them, but still want to be surrounded by other folks who are thinking about um, upskilling or eventually building their own companies. Thank you, Michael. Um, I'll keep answering some of the questions here because it feels like there were a lot sent earlier. So tips for choosing co-founders, I will just boil it down to optimize for your own strengths and find people who will complement those. Or know your own strengths and find people looking for co-founders and figure out if there's a fit there. And there are a lot of people who join Propel, Propel in the midst of co-founder searching, and they're happy to join an existing idea if they believe in it, or they're looking to bring someone onto an idea that they have, but they're not married to either way. And, and that's an interesting way to kind of co-founder date, if you will. Um, Fine-tuning an idea and understanding viability. So I, I talked really about how to preliminarily pressure test for an idea. To fine-tune it, um, you, depending if it is a digital product or a physical product, you would want to beta test it. So we had 22 beta members that were paying something. A lot of people would create a freemium where you get your early members in for free and then you eventually create tiering or you eventually price it. We wanted to make sure that people would actually pay for this, given how many free communities exist. And so we did that with folks that we actually had already been hosting live events and conversations, like Robin attended one that was a little bit more personal, but I would host these dinner and dialogues in my apartment in Williamsburg and um, meet with people who would want to just talk about an idea they had been thinking about, a problem that existed in, a, in the world. And so they were the ones who, who helped me fine tune um, my product. And launching before you're ready. I also talk about essentially don't be a perfectionist. The saying better, uh, I'm sorry, done is better than perfect. That really goes a long way in probably the first two or three years of building a business. Um, ben, I didn't get into entrepreneurship at UVA, though I know there's an entrepreneurship club. I know a lot of people um, associate entrepreneurship with the comm school. I don't think that's right. I was in Batten, which is known for public policy, but it's public policy and leadership. And I tell whenever I talk to the student services or alumni at Batten, like maybe more so than anyone, at least in my 45 person undergrad class, like I ran with that leadership piece of it. And I took a lot of classes on 
like ethics um, in business. And I, I just tried to better understand what I would want to look for in joining a company. Again, never thought I would be the one doing the founding, but here I am. So I'm sure that's evolved. My brother and sister both were at UVI, so I can also ask them um, if they remember that, though. They, they weren't entrepreneur um, or, or comm majors either. Um, cool. So, yeah, I, I do believe life experience, life experience does prepare you. I think, um, the, the mental aspects I think are what are very different, but you can still draw from past experiences. So for me, the discipline I gained from being a student athlete and, um, trying to get good grades at UVA has been, you know, truly like unparalleled in anything else that I've done um, in, in my life. But I don't think a lot of my um, workplace experiences personally prepared me for how to handle some of the things that I'm handling now. And maybe that's a personal, a, a personal statement. But I would, um, I guess what I'm trying to do is normalize that if that's how you, you feel. And, and maybe some people on this call do feel that way. Hopefully this was helpful and you feel like you have some next steps with you or earlier on. Um, Awesome. Well, I put my email in there. The website is propel.run and my email is emily at propel.run. So please like, don't be a stranger. Robin knows I love Trevor's news too. Love talking to people. Um, won't pitch you on propel. Just want to hear what you're up to and um, feel free to email me with any questions that you maybe didn't feel comfy uh, bringing up or would just be a longer conversation. I hope you all have a great night. Thank you so much. Thanks, Emily. And thanks everyone for joining. Cool. Have a good one.